A very warm welcome to everyone uh, in this uh, worship service and uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, every time I have the opportunity to preach, not just in uh, uh, during the night in Bethel, but most especially during worship service, I am very excited and uh, I am privileged to uh, to enjoy that because I know that uh, uh, it's not it's not very often that I get this opportunity, so I, I am really excited to be here with you this uh, Sunday morning, last Sunday of, uh, of February. There's a lot of concerns that we are all worried about, thinking about, anxious about because of uh, what's going on in Russia. Uh, so many perspectives, so many uh, analysis, and what is the impact of this? with you and me as Filipinos and with you and me as uh, Christians, as believers, uh, people talking about the end times, this is the end of the world, and so many things in our minds at the moment, uh, maybe worrying about the increase in prices and all these things. And so I, I was supposed to talk about uh, the purpose of prayer, uh, but then I realized the necessity of talking about uh, the sovereignty of God, the will of God, uh, and, of course, we are still going to talk about prayer. And prayer, what is the role of prayer? And why do we have to pray if God has a perfect will and, and he has orchestrated all these things? And so we, we have a, a mind that is a little bit confused, especially when we are drawn towards the idea that the sovereignty of God, uh, you know, everything he works out in his purpose. So what is the need of prayer? And uh, so what I'd like to do is look at this particular passage in First Kings uh, and uh, understand more about the will of God in prayer. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, open in prayer and let's continue with the study of the Word of God this morning. Dear Lord and Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to once again be uh, be before you to be here before you and joining hands and maybe some of us could not make it in church uh, that are only joining us through worship online our friends all over the world our people who are uh, probably uh, sick and they have to just stay at home we continue to pray for them those who are uh, experiencing grief those who are experiencing many challenges in uh, in this daily life, we know where we um, we are of this. We are not of this world, but we are in this world, and we know that in the world we shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer; you promised us, because you have overcome the world. Christ has overcome the world. Lord, we ask that you uh, bless us as we uh, we continue to study about uh, the will, your will, and study about the role of prayer in our lives. And may the meditations of our hearts and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable unto you, uh, our Lord and our Redeemer. This is what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, I know that um, we have been talking about prayer for a number of times. In my series, I've talked about like the consequences of not praying. We talked about the causes of not praying. Why, why are we not praying? And then we talked about what we miss when we don't pray. And then we talked about the purpose. You know, we, we said that uh, ultimately we, we, we don't get uh, tempted. You know, we're, we, we are uh, drawn away from temptation. You know, pray so that you'll not enter into temptation. We also looked at uh, other aspects of prayer, like uh, Christ's prayer. What does it lead to us? And uh, uh, we also uh, briefly talked about sometimes when we pray we forget the main goal our main goal is to satisfy uh, the will of God it's not just doing our own and uh, just being uh, selfish and we are praying for the things that we need for ourselves but we need to delight ourselves in the will of God and he shall give you the desires of our hearts uh, one of the primary concern right now uh, of many believers in the world uh, particularly in the Russian uh, Ukraine region is the uh, the ongoing war at that time. It seemed like uh, it could also lead to 
uh, Russia and China uh, allying themselves and possibly people are saying maybe because of Saudi Arabia supporting, maybe there's going to be a World War Three. So now there are some people that are um, thinking about these things and uh, putting some concerns even among believers. Of course, we know that there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to be... Uh, be concerned about because we know that God has not appointed us to wrath. Before all these things will happen, before all this world will disappear and uh, maybe a threat of nuclear bombs, we are, are going to be rescued before anything that will happen. And, and besides, you know, God has already ordained that this world is going to perish anyway. You know, in the, in the world, in this world, you know, he's going to melt it and he's going to burn it and he's going to have a brand new, uh, he's not, he promised he's not going to destroy the earth with, with water anymore. He said there's not going to be any more flood, flood, but he didn't say that he's not going to destroy it. But this time he's going to destroy it with further heat and, and melt, and, and then there's going to be a newer heaven and new earth, which we're going to be staying with God forever. So that's the promise of ultimate end of us, of our believers. So there's really, uh, you know, the bottom bottom line is there's really nothing for us to worry about because we know the end of the story. We know revelations. We know already if we're looking at a drama, we already know the enemy has lost. You know, we are speaking of, of the loss of enemy and Satan in the past tense, although he's still coming in the future. We already know that he's not going to win. There's not no victory with Satan, only victory comes with God. So that's the promise of Revelation. And that should be our premise. So uh, between prayer and sovereign will of God, we, we try to answer the question, you know, why do we have to pray? And we have our normal Bible studies and uh, regular Bible studies, weekly Bible studies with our friends in high school. And one of the questions that came up was, I mean, sometimes we are, you know, What's in it for us to pray about Ukraine? We already know that Russia is going to probably take over like Belarus. They've just kind of like walked through it and they conquered them and they're bringing Russia back. And it seemed like it's just he, Russia is just fulfilling the the uh, prophetic uh, uh, words that were mentioned in the uh, Ezekiel 37, uh, 36, 37, 38, 39, where you know, the north will be attacking Israel and the east, most likely China, will be attacking Israel. So, uh, you know, so why do we have to pray for them? I mean, it's we we know that we need to pray for them because they are, um, they are people there, they're Christians there, they're believers there, they're Israeli Jews, uh, Christians there, that are, or even any other people, we, we need to pray for those people who are uh, in the midst of those war. Uh, having said that, we, we also need to consider the reality of why do we have to pray when we already know that God has a perfect will. So, of course, we have different views on that. Uh, some people don't believe in the ultimate sovereign will of God. They just think of God as, you know, a God that makes a decision. He has all knowledge and he doesn't have to have like a predetermined will or predestined will of God. Uh, but nevertheless, the concept of God is in control, is there. And we may agree to disagree about the destination or the destiny of every single event uh, that God has. But we will never disagree about the control that God has. So let's just use that word, control. God has full control of everything. Whatever you decide, uh, he did not, maybe he did not ordain it or whatever your position is on that. I believe that God has ordained even your own decision. But even if we disagree on that, let's just say that you uh, disagree with that. The concept of uh, my choice and my will is not predetermined by God. Uh, he is still in control, and we believe in that. We, we cannot disagree with the fact that whatever you do, you cannot say that I am in control and God is just dependent on me. You can never say that. So even if you make a choice, I'd like to do this. I'd like to go war with Ukraine. Uh, even Russia, even Putin, does not have full control. He knows that he's doing it. He thinks that he's doing it on his own. But God has full control. And so if God has full control and God has every single thing in mind, why do we have to pray? And, and this is the important part. Of course, he, he told us to pray. Uh, he told us to pray for our government. He told us to pray without ceasing. He, he told us basically to pray for all men. 
uh, not even just our friends, not even just our relatives, even uh, our closest friends, our loved ones. No, he says, if you can pray, pray for all men, pray for non-believers, for believers and all that. So he is the God who answers by fire. He is the God that answers our prayers. He's not the God who is like, okay, I have a plan already. And then so, okay, and just let you go. He is the God who hears our prayers. And when you talk to him, it's not like, okay, I know this guy, I know this guy. Okay, like transparently uh, just answers our prayers. No, he listens to us like a father would. And this is what we will find in the story of First Kings. Uh, and this is a very famous Mount Carmel experience. In fact, I would like to title this message, The Mount Carmel Experience in Prayer. And we may not have that kind of Mount Carmel experience in our lives, but simple prayers like, Lord, please, if you can, if this be your will, uh, heal my uh, dad, heal my, my mom, or heal my child, and you can have an experience of Mount Carmel. And again, the, the experience itself is not the ultimate goal. The, the, the ultimate goal is being subjected to God's ultimate plan. And, and being subjected means you are... Uh, allowing God to work in your life regardless of how he answers your prayer. It's kind of like a disclaimer. It's like, okay, Lord, if you don't want to answer my prayer, I'm going to be subjected to your ultimate and sovereign plan. And that's what Jesus did. And when Jesus cried and, and he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me, the answer, you know, the answer was no. Lord, you bring me comfort. The answer was no. Lord, bring me uh, an answer to this prayer. And the answer was no. So ultimately, we think about uh, Christ as an example of our prayers, you know, and, and even his own death. Uh, he, he's not just thinking about, Lord, heal me. No, he was even, Lord, uh, save me. Uh, I don't want to go through this. But nevertheless, it says, if it's your will, let your will be done. I think that's the ultimate goal that uh, many of us sometimes forget. Our, our goal is uh, uh, is to follow what is God's moral will, what is God's perfect will for us. When Christ was asking for comfort, when ask, asking for company, when Christ was asking for confirmation, when Christ was asking for an answer prayer, God the Father said no. And this is what is amazing, because even if he said no, ultimately the subjection of Christ as the Son of God provided us the ultimate sacrifice that took away our sins. So it, what I'm saying is whatever we're going through, you know, how painful it could be, like, like the death of Christ, we may experience not that, we may experience something else, but God has a perfect will. There are people dying, we know that, left and right in Ukraine right now. And uh, we can do our best to support them, to provide them, uh, whatever needed to be provided for. And we may be, some people may be even sacrificing their lives, being there in the center, uh, doing like ultimately self-sacrifice and saving people's lives. And we may not have the same opportunity to do that. Nevertheless, our prayers are with those people. So having said that, what is this Mount Carmel experience that explains about the prayer and the will of God? So let's take a look in a passage in... Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, and we will see that it's a, a very powerful message. It's a very common passage, something that we are familiar with, but uh, we're just going to focus this and do an exposition on it, and then we're going to uh, meditate on some um, theology, some doctrine, some teaching about how we can synchronize prayer and understanding who God is, and who is this God who answers prayer and shows the ultimate uh, sovereignty and ultimate uh, power that he has and ultimate knowledge and all that to answer and what is the purpose of him answering prayers. Okay, so let's read. It says there, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long holds she between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Now, this was a time when people were worshiping Baal. And the Israelites were supposed to uh, 
worship only one God. They are monotheistic, and God was in fact ruling them before they had kings. But during this time, uh, many kings have followed the Assyrian gods, the Persian gods, the Babylonian gods, and at this particular time with Elijah, these were the Baal gods. Now, um, I've been working on uh, biblical archaeology, and I, I will not have the time to show it today, but in Israel, there are some, uh, we call it Tel, or Tel, like Tel Dan, or Tel Sheva. Uh, we call it Tel Aviv. So these are like small communities where uh, people gathered and in layers of time uh, become biblical archaeological sites. And what we have found in biblical archaeology is there is this Judah, you know, like Israel and Judah were the two kingdoms that were divided uh, after Solomon. So there's Jeroboam in the north and Rehoboam in the south. You can study that, that in your own time. But uh, when the Persians have conquered, have destroyed Israel, which is the northern part, the Judahites were still going on with their kind of uh, kingdom for about a few hundred years. During those times, they uh, we are able to preserve those Judahite communities or cities like Lachish and Havla and all those other places. And even now, we can look at all those sites and maybe in the second session of this i will show you some pictures of lakish and all these small community judahites where they actually practiced baalism or non-real god gods and uh, when they did that what they did was in the small in the small communities they desecrated this like at the time of josiah in the time of hezekiah when he destroyed those kings, uh, those uh, the altars, they desecrated them. In other words, they made them like a, like a reminder that this is not supposed to be done. So in other words, these Judaite communities, they had these places where they worship the, the Baals and, and all these other gods. But then they also, instead of having that, uh, they also created, um, you know, places where they can burn animal sacrifices. And, 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 of course, God didn't want that. So when they were conquered again, or when they went back to Christ, or went back to God, I mean, when they went back to the real God, they, they destroyed this. In, in fact, it was funny because in Lakish, in uh, one of the archaeological sites, they found an old... Uh, uh, non-God um, place of worship, and they put a toilet seat on it. That means, you know, that's been desecrated, similar to what Josiah did or Hezekiah did when he destroyed all these small altars. Now, this is about the same time that people of Israel or and Judah, in this particular time was Israel, they were getting into different gods, sometimes the Egyptian gods and all that. And so Baal was the more powerful god at that time. And Baal was uh, being worshipped, even the Israelites. So when when uh, uh, when Elijah came to them, guys, you have to make a choice. You have to go with Baal or, or, or we'll worship God. And so this is what he said. If Baal be God, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. In other words, okay, show me what you got. This is basically what, what uh, the people of uh, Israel were saying. Uh, then Elijah said unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now, uh, he doesn't know that there are still so many, you know, individual prophets that were scattered abroad because of the the power of uh, Jezebel, power of Baal, and powerful power of Ahab. Okay, so he said, let them, therefore, give us two bullocks, um, two, two bulls, or two cows, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and um, uh, and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put it on, put no fire under. And let's call on the name of the gods, and I will call on the name of my Lord, of the Lord. The capital L O R D is the word Jehovah, or Y H W H. It's not even pronounced in Hebrew. They take out the vowels on it, and they use the word master. They use the word Lord or Adonai instead of Jehovah. 
in the God, that's the word Elohim, and the, and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answer, oh, that's good. All right, it's well spoken. Let's go, let's go. Let's see this magic. Let's see this uh, wonderful event in Mount Carmel. And by the way, those of you who are interested in going to Israel this year or next year, you know, we may be able to find uh, this place, Mount Carmel, and find some of these archaeological sites. If you're interested, and this is just a plug, if you're interested uh, in joining with us, not this year, in 2023, you know, you can let me know. Uh, you can email me or ask uh, Pastor Maiman so that uh, you can join us in uh, a very beautiful, you know, it may be your dream, so it will be a dream come true when we do backpacking in Israel. All right, and so verse 28, then they took uh, the Balak, uh, which was given them, and they dress it and call it on the name of Baal from morning until evening until noon. Now you could imagine what they're trying to do here. They're saying, oh, Baal, hear us, but there was no voice nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. So they are going dancing in all of these prayers and all this, you know, calling for Baal. But Baal is no god. It's, you know, it is just uh, a created um, a deity that the people have made. It's, it's not a true god. So by noontime, now you can imagine it started in the morning, maybe about three hours after, so around noontime. Uh, Elijah mocked them. All right, you should cry loud. They can't hear you. You know, you need to uh, pray to Abel, uh, be uh, louder and uh, because he is a God, you know. He's, after all, he's powerful. And maybe he's talking. Maybe he's, uh, he's busy at the moment. And he's pursuing. In other words, you can think about the sarcasm that uh, Elijah is talking about here. In other words, our God is never going to be talking or busy or pursuing something that he will not hear our prayers. The true God will not. Okay. Because he's being sarcastic here. And he says, maybe he's in a journey. So our God can never be like on a journey that he might miss some of our prayers. So he's not that kind of God. He is the ultimate God who is supposed to be worshipped. And we are going to look at this characteristic attribute of God and in turn understand how we should pray. And this is the beauty of under, understanding here, the experience of Mount Carmel. We are able to look at who God is and in this respect, be able to find out what is it that is different when we pray to God as opposed to just uh, a wish. You know, I wish I could have this and I wish I could have that. That's a different thing because when we pray, we're actually asking God, knowing who he is. And so the basis of our asking of prayer is understanding who God is. He is the ultimate, powerful, holy, and loving God. He's not gonna. He's not gonna give us something that will destroy us, that will uh, uh, destroy our faith, that will uh, ultimately um, take us away from Him. And so this is very important because when we study these words, what we are really understanding is who God is. And then when we understand who God is, then we can understand more how we should pray and what is the value of that prayer in our lives. Okay, so it came to pass, and we're going to outline this in a minute. Let's just go over the text. So, um, you know, and it says here, maybe maybe he's walking, maybe he's pursuing, maybe he's in a journey or per, per adventure, or, or maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. Okay, and so they cried aloud more and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. Now notice, what does that got to do with, uh, you know, uh, with God, calling God? You know, self-infliction, you know, and people think about that. If you self-inflict, maybe God will be merciful to you. If you are self-pitying, maybe God will be, uh, will be nice to you. No, no, it has nothing to do with that. Do you answer to prayers has nothing to do with what you do to yourself okay so always remember that so it came to pass you know, even blood gushed out of them it says so oh, now it came to pass that midday was passed and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice uh, that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regard so they gave up okay and so the bottom line is they gave up Okay, my turn. Elijah comes in and he gathers all the people. He says, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. 
And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. They tried to break it down. He repaired them. And he took 12 stones. The 12 stones refers to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he, um, and then he said, Israel shall be thy name. Okay, he's saying the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. So he kind of repaired it, put in the 12 stones. He made a trench about the altar. A trench means like a canal. Okay. Um, so he put in a grate, uh, contained two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order. Okay. Not notice he is organized. He cut the bullock in pieces, laid them on the wood perfectly because he knows that it's going to be on fire. And what is fascinating is he filled the barrels with water. Now, people are saying, okay, actually, this is what made it uh, caught the fire because the water that he put in was, like, kind of tricky. It was actually gasoline, okay, which was the cheating. Uh, of course, other people right there and there, the Bay of Prophets would know right away. Uh, but it was really water that they pour in, in the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And so what did he, what did he say after that? And he said, do it the second time. And they did the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. So they are soaked with water. Not just one pouring of water. Not just twice, but a third time. Okay. And he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came in. And he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. All right, so he knew who this God is. No, no one else is he referring to, but the God of Abraham is Israel, the God of Isaac. And he said that thou, thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy words. Okay, so he said that let it be known you are this God, the God of Israel. And in verse 37, he says, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God. And that was turn their heart back again. Okay, let's just go through the lessons first, the whole text, and then we can meditate on them in detail. Okay, and then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the swords and the dust and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the, all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Lord, he is gone. The Lord, he is gone. And Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal and, his, and let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kehan and slew them there. Okay, so uh, that was the victory at Mount Carmel. Another story is after that one, but let's just focus on this, uh, this thing. When we look at prayer, our ultimate uh, idea is for ourselves. Now, look at what is Elijah's prayer. What does that reveal to us? Um, it's very important that we realize who God is. I think we are forgetting sometimes that the very first commandment is that uh, you have no other gods before me, that I am a jealous God. And this should pervade every single aspect of our lives. Let it be known, he said, that he is God. There is no one else. So for the sake of alliteration, the first word that we are going to look at or use to describe who God is, is starting with the letter S. We're going to use the word solo God. He is the only God. He is the solo God. Is he the solo God in your life? In other words, he, is he the preeminent? Is he the only one that is most important in your life? Because if your prayer is like that, then the things of this world cannot be more priority, more important than who God is. Even your own life is not more important than God is. Even your loved ones cannot be more important than who God is. Because he is the solo God. He is the prior, primary objective of your life. Now, you need to look at God on who he is. He's a very jealous God. And anything that can put over and beyond him and, and put, him for, put him first place in, instead of him becomes your God. 
and he doesn't want that. It can be your career, it can be your work, it can be your, your family, it can be anything. And that can be your idol. And that is very important. The idolatry that the Israelites experience is just a reminder that in this age, in this time, there's so many things that can be our God. It can be our social media, or we cannot live without. We cannot live without cell phones. We cannot live without something. And the only thing that we should think of, of something that we should never be able to live without is God. Not even your own most loved one can prevent you from loving who God is. If, if that particular someone prevents you from loving putting God first in your life, then God will take away that person from you. I'm not saying that, you know, my wife was taken away because I was giving her more importance. It's not that. It's just saying that sometimes God will test you. Remember when Abraham had to offer Isaac, the only son Isaac, your only son Isaac, he's even like sarcastically mentioning your only son. Are you willing to give him away? This is going to be your sacrifice. And he was ready to put him to death. And then the angel uh, representing God stopped him from doing that because God knows, and he knows from the very beginning. But that particular act showed the confidence that Abraham had towards God, that whatever it is he's doing, whatever his prayer was, he has to be following the idea, the, the point that he is a jealous God. Remember the call in verse 21. How long halt ye between two opinions? How long halt ye? If Baal be God, serve him. If God is God, serve him. You cannot have God and mammon and God and Baal or God and something else. You're going to have one foot on the church and one foot in Christianity and one foot on the world. And that's very important. So he is a solo God. God should be the one followed. In Exodus 23, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is not just a declaration statement. It was an imperative statement. This is a command. And you need to make God a solo God. So one of the few questions that you might ask yourself, what have you replaced with God, God with today? You know, as I speak to you this morning uh, virtually, and some of you are here in the church, what is it that is taking God over, or taking the place of God in your life? Um are you maybe keeping something from God that God knows in a way? Uh, in a sense, that would be uh, putting more importance than uh, that person, than that thing, or that person, than God. What is it? Maybe you know, if if that is the case, maybe you need to explore more deep in your heart, meditate in your heart. The Lord, uh, I mean, uh, when the psalmist David uh, wrote about the his prayer. Uh, if I regard iniquity in my heart, if I regard, if I, uh, if I uh, preserve and then keep them in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Although it says following that, he says, uh, but the Lord has heard me. In other words, God's faithfulness remained true to him and correcting him. And when he committed sin with Bathsheba, you know, God had corrected him. And, you know, in his experience of that, he said, like, his pain was up to the bones. You know, he's, he's so repentant that he can think of violating this uh, uh, sin, violating God by making this uh, more important than uh, God himself. Okay, so that's one point. Um, the first point is that do you consider God as a solo God in your life? All right, now, uh, in another passage, he says there, who is this God? He says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac the God of uh, Jacob, the God of Israel. Uh, the second ask that we are going to look at here is, is that um, uh, when, we, when we look at that passage in verse 36, we notice that he said that this God is not just the God of today. Okay, He's the God of Abraham. In fact, you know what? He's the God before Abraham. So what is he implying? Not just he is a solo God. The second point that we need to remember before we leave today in church is that he is a self-existent God. Okay? He, need, he did not need anyone to make him exist. Okay? Now, this is a, a concept that is beyond our understanding. Uh, he is not limited 
in knowledge. He has infinite wisdom. He has infinite presence. He has infinite justice. He is infinite in love, righteousness, and truth. He is ultimately sovereign, not just in existence, but in every aspect of making someone a deity, a God, a most powerful being. Now, the concept of God, if he is the extreme, almighty, only solo God, the concept of having that means that there are no other gods. Because if you have two gods, then that means one is no more supreme, it's no more extreme, no more almighty, no more all-powerful, because there are two of them. And that negates the idea of the concept of God. So if you are, if you are going to believe in an extreme, uh, supernatural, beyond understanding God, it has to be only one. It has to be monotheistic. So uh, that's the theological part of it. So he is self-existent one. He never had to make himself appear or exist because from eternity all the way down, eternity past and eternity future, he is self-existent. What has that got to do with our prayer? Well, he knows every single aspect of our prayers and our needs that we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about what's going on in Ukraine. Of course, we are concerned about the people that are dying there or just being getting destroyed, properties that are getting destroyed. But overall picture, God is still in control and he is self-existent. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. And maybe at a time, and you would say, why is then God not stopping that? You know, that the evil in this world, why can God just stop the evil in this world? And the answer is in Second Peter, where he said, the Lord is not slack. He's never going to be late in his promise. He is, he, and, and as some consider slackness, but he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, if Christ were to come today, no one else can be rescued from sin. Everybody who is not, has not believed in Christ is going to hell. And he doesn't want that. So he extends it, he extends the time, he extends the time. And when the time comes, he is the God of just, he's the God of uh, love. But he's going to make the people who committed sin or who rejected him, he's going to make them, pun he's going to punish them and make them uh, suffer for all the things that they've done. Now, I remember in, uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 14, for there will come a day where you will answer, fear God and fear, uh, fear God and keep His commandments. Why? Because there will come a day that you will face God, and when you face God on your own, it's either going to be did you have a relationship with Christ or not, and that will be the end of it. If you did, then that's good. You'll have a, a presence with Him in eternity. So He's not just a solo God, but He's also a self-existent God. Okay. And the last part, which is found in uh, the uh, the rest of the answer to prayer, the fire coming down from uh, heaven. Uh, we'll look at that particular passage. It says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones, every single thing. Now, this is the exclusive, uh, comprehensive manifestation of the power of God. The, the, wa the water, even the water, was burning because of the power of God. So we see here the solo-ness of God. He is the only God, solo God. We can see here the self-existent God. And lastly, and we will close with this, he is a self-soul, sorry. He is a soul-powerful God. In other words, he is the ultimate, unlimited, powerful God. He's no limit in his power. There is no... Uh, there is uh, no way to turn off the power of God or minimize it or, you know, like volume off and on or, or, or minimize the power of God. No, there is no such thing. Uh, when the fire of the Lord came, it consumed every single dust and every single part of it. And this goes with uh, the understanding of, of uh, who God is in our prayer. We know that... Uh, even in these times of crisis, even in these times of COVID-19, in these times of, of war, in these times of calamities, in these times of famine, in these times of you know price increase and all that, God is still the sole powerful God. He is our God and He is our Father. He is our Dad. He is our, like, 
you know, very loving dad who will never, made, he made us at the apple of his eye. And so if he is that God and he's caring and loving father to us, what do we expect? What we should expect is that he is going to stay with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. That is exactly what his promise is. So he is a soul God. He's a jealous God. So you, you, you have to put him in first place in your life. He is a self-existent God. He's so powerful. He's so knowledgeable. It's nothing you can hide from him. And lastly, if you look at this, he is an ultimate, all-powerful, only powerful God, the sole powerful God. And uh, we should take uh, comfort in being reminded of this, that God is in his all-powerful and sole powerful, meaning he is uh, the only God that is that can save us from any of this calamity. No one else is more powerful than him. We should realize then that um, because of this, that uh, the power of God uh, rests solely on him. And in the light of all these things that are happening, in the light of all these things that are uh, going, we are going through in the world today, Ukraine war, COVID-19, I don't know what other variants may happen. We don't know what's going to happen next in in the prizes and uh, maybe this is the end of the world or maybe it's again going to be disrupted just like you know when ussr got dispersed and then they were broken into different countries we you know we thought that oh it's not never going to happen anymore but then it's happening again so it's just fulfilling what is in the scriptures that there is a land from the north who is going to come down to israel and there's a land from the east or a nation from the east who's coming down uh towards israel and this is in the light of the revelations. But putting all these into perspectives, he is a solo God. He is a self-existent God. And he is a soul powerful God. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. So our attitude it should not be like that of an entitled little child, but that of a humble servant, knowing that it was only by God's grace that we are not consumed. He is a very powerful God. He is a God that answers by fire. So we should not be like a little child who is entitled and Lord, and give me this, like, like a genie, treating God as a genie. But realizing more of his jealousness and his jealousy and his, and his uh, self-existence and that he is so powerful. And no one else can provide these things, all the things that we need except God. Okay, so... Uh, I hope that you will bring this to yourself and whatever you'll be and continue meditating on him and uh, continue reaching out for the lost. Because that's our main goal in this life, to reach out for the lost and uh, bring them into the knowledge and the growth and uh, understanding who Christ is. Okay, let's have a word. Dear God and Father, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Give us wisdom and strength and understanding. May your name be glorified in everything we do. Um, bless us in the worship and the rest of the week. All this we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you.